from The Dark Imp, helping parents reclaim family time by playing board games together. Today, area control games. Now an area control game is a game in which as a player you are trying to control an area of the board. Usually these games come with big boards, often maps, that you are moving possibly many people around to try and control areas. So an example of this is risk, when you're literally moving troops around and having battles for different regions. Uh, now some area control games are full of, the, in fact most area control games are full of this sort of conflict. Uh, and that conflict might work fine in some families who like a bit of pull and push. And in other families, it might be a step too far. So bear that in mind as you're thinking about area control games and whether they'd fit in your family. So today I want to show you two different games. One is very much of this kind of, we're gonna battle for different regions, I'm gonna kick you out, uh, and then I'm going to possibly leave myself vulnerable for attack in a future round. And another one is very much an area control game, but doesn't have the conflict. So it's quite interesting. These are both good games for families uh, for different reasons. So this is Small World. First of all, we'll talk about Small World, which is the, um, which is the sort of battle-y, the battle-y more, more typical area control game. And then we'll talk about Bosque, which is much more gentle but still involves thinking about different areas of the board and how you can get uh, manipulate uh, you, what you're doing to get control of them. So, first of all, Small World. Now, I think this is a good shout for families because of the theme. It's got a fantasy theme and there's lots of different races within the game. And actually, during the course of a game, you get to play lots of these different races. Depending on uh, the choices you make, you might get to play three uh, probably three different races um, and the combinations of these different races are quite exciting so first of all I'll show you the board there are two different boards they're each double-sided because um, it matters which board you play on for what player count so this is the five player it goes it plays two to five players this is the five player board the four player board is on the other side uh, we'll look at the two and three player board because it's easier to manage, it's half the size. Uh, three player board, two player board. Um, so there are more regions, uh, the, the higher the player count because of course there's going to be more uh, characters, more races on the board. So you can see there's all sorts of different terrains. We've got mountains and, and forest and we've got water areas and marshes and all sorts of farmland and things like that. And then uh, you, as, a, as a, a player, you're going to be able to choose on your first turn, oh, dropped one, you're going to be able to choose uh, one of the race and power combinations. So there are all these different tiles which represent the different races. This is the Tritons, the Elves, the Ghouls, and the artwork's great, real fantasy theme. Um, so they're going to be shuffled and then placed out six of them in a line um, at random. But they're going to be paired up with these special powers. So the special powers, they fit in nicely to the race and provide a race with power combination. So this would be bivouacking ghouls or you might have seafaring elves. So you're going to have six of these combinations and on your first turn you're going to choose one. Uh, there's, there's this line of six and if you, the, the one furthest away from the stack, the deck, of, the deck of tokens, the deck of tiles, is always available for free. If you want to take any of the ones closer to the deck, you have to pay a victory coin on top of each one uh, that is further down in, in, the, in, in the column. So you'll start with five of these and you'll gain these during the game. This is how you score at the end of the game. Most coins, most victory coins is going to win. So you will, you might decide you, you prefer a different combination and pay on top of other things. So let's say we've got the Swamp Ghouls, and we choose this as our first, um, we choose this as our first race. Uh, now you have to get your troops, your ghouls, and there's this huge 
token whoopsie there's this huge token tray full of all the different race tokens so if you're ghouls you're going to look for the ghouls i don't know where they are uh oh no that's not ghoul oh yeah those are the ghouls and you're going to take them now you don't necessarily take all of them it depends what combination of power and um, race you have got so if we've got the swamp ghouls we're going to add up the four on uh, the swamp and add up the five on the ghouls and we get nine so we're going to take nine swamp ghouls if i'd have taken if i if the combination had been seafaring ghouls five and five i would have taken ten uh, so i'm going to take that number of tokens and those are my troops that are, that are available for me at the start of the game, there's going to be some lost tribes, uh, these tokens, which are already on the board. They're going to be on any square or on any terrain which has one of these little white squares on them. So there are already regions where there are tribes which have to be conquered. What you do on your turn is you take your stack of um, available uh tokens and you're going to decide where you're going to conquer now at the beginning of the game you have to choose a region that's at the edge of the board or borders a c which is at the edge of the board so this region would be any of these regions would be fine any of these regions or any of these regions around this sorry these regions around this c here as well also around here and here so you have to start at the edge of the board um, if there, you have to have two tokens to go into a region. So you take two tokens. Here are my ghouls. I'm going to put them in a region that I'm conquering. So if I decide I want to start here and try and conquer this region, I put two tokens in. Now, if, if there's a lost tribe in there, I need an extra token. As you go on in the game, there might be other barriers. Any mountain region, for example, is going to be an extra token that you need because they're harder terrains to conquer. There are There is one um, race or power that allows you uh, to put mountains in other areas. So to cr sort of create mountainous areas that will also add um, one troop that you need to conquer it there are troll lairs and these sort of forts um, and they also are going to uh, throw up uh, an extra barrier so you need an extra token so you could have all sorts of things piled on to increase the uh, defense of an area so that people that are attacking you have to have to use more troops to get in there so you need two, at least two to get in there, plus any of the other ones. You get rid of everything that's in there, uh, any troops that are in there. If they belong to another player, that other player gets to has to discard one back to the box and takes any other troops back. So if the other player has three troops in there and you're going in with five troops, they get to, they get to keep two, but one goes back in the box. So their troop number in total is reducing. Uh, and then you do another attack and you do another attack and you're going to conquer as many regions as you can with the tokens you've got or at least as many as you choose to and then at the end of uh, when you've decided you've conquered enough regions or you don't have enough um, tokens to conquer anymore you can uh, or you can have a final conquer if you don't have quite enough regions uh, quite enough tokens and you can roll this sort of uh, this sort of dice which has some sides which are blank one that says one, one that says two, one that says three. And uh, you roll it and it tells you what additional uh, attack power you have or what additional defense power. I can't remember. It's one one way or the other. So you can on the last attack, you can you can you can take another region if you want. Then you redeploy your troops and decide which areas you're going to fortify. And then it's another player's turn. So each of these different uh, powers the, each of these have different powers so the fortified power allows you to place these forts uh the elves have a special power as well it's pretty difficult to remember what they all are and this just fell on the floor um so everybody gets this absolutely huge player aid i mean player aids generally are much smaller than this and this is absolutely huge so on one side it's got the game turns and the terrain types and the map symbols and on the other side it's got the uh, races and the special powers so you can see here if you look at um, uh, let's see let's look at elves 
When you're conquered, you suffer no loss. So you bring all your tokens back in from your region. You don't have to get rid of one. Humans, when you, you collect one bonus coin for each farmland region you occupy at the end of uh, the turn. So any of these regions, these farmland regions, if you've got your humans in there, you get extra coins. So at the end of the get, at the end of the turn, you get coins for each region you occupy. Some of the powers give you extra coins, as you can see. Then there, are, or some of the races. Then there are special powers that allow you to move more freely during different terrain types, or indeed the uh, the water, which most most races can't go to. They may help you with conquest quests. Um, they might give you extra coins. They might help you when your race goes into decline. So I said at the beginning, you can, you, you, you'll have a chance to play several races. Well, when your race has suffered what you think is irreparable losses and you think it's had its day, on your turn, you, choose, you can choose to go into decline. You leave one of your tokens on each of the regions that you occupy and remove all the others and put them back in the box. Then you flip over your race uh, to, to the other side so that you can see that it's not active, it's in decline. Then those um, troops will stay on the board, they can't fight, They're, they act as lost troops, lost tribes. Um, but they still give you a point at the end of each turn if you carry on occupying that area. Then at the beginning of next turn you choose a new combination of um, of race and power so it's got a lovely theme there's quite a bit of um there's quite a bit of conflict but it's the the, the fantasy elements and the exciting powers of the different races i think outweighs that issue uh, that you might find with with the competing so that's small world Secondly, I said it's a very different area control game, and it is. The theme, even the theme is, is quite different. Bosk. It's about a group of trees. That's what Bosk is, I think, uh, like a little, uh, like a copse of trees. Um, so it says a game of majestic trees and falling leaves. Now, Bosk is run over four seasons, spring, summer, autumn and winter, but actually it's just the spring and autumn seasons where there's action. Summer and winter are just scoring phases. So there's two main phases of the game. Now, as with most area control games, there's a, a, a map, a board, which shows distinct regions and a grid, which is a common feature of area control games. It's double-sided, you can play with two to four players, with this, this side is the two player game and you can see the size of these, um, these squares, the grid on, on the map. And the other side is the three to four player game which has smaller squares. Um, when you're playing within three, with three players you keep within this line, when you're playing with four players you play with the whole board. So uh, you've got different colourful regions and you've got a grid. Now. Uh, each player has a different set of uh, trees and leaves in their colour. Um, a small complaint that I have about this game is that under certain light, the colours can look very similar. I mean, they're beautiful colours. They're designed to be kind of autumn tree colours. We've got red, yellow, which is quite easy to differentiate. But then we have orange, which looks under some lights quite like the red. And we have purple, which again, under some lights, can look very similar to the others. They have sort of tried to help a little bit by putting an underline, uh, underlining the, the, the numbers on the orange ones to show they're slightly different. So, and it comes with these lovely trays so that you can just pick out all of your stuff and have it in one place. It's super easy and I really like that feature of it, it's great. So you've got, let's say we're um, this is this is the this is the map we're playing on. When it's my turn in spring, I'm going to put my trees out. So on my turn, I put one tree out. I can choose any of my trees, and I can choose any intersection on the board. It can't be right at the edge of the board. Uh, it's got to be an intersection of two lines on the grid somewhere on the board. So let's say I put it there. Someone else puts theirs over there. You can see the numbers on these different trees. Uh, put that there, 
put that there okay so now we've got uh, some trees on the map uh, at the end of the round where we've, we've each got eight trees there's going to be trees all over the place it really looks beautiful this game uh, at the end of spring when everybody's got their trees out you're going to look along each row and each column and decide who wins that row and column and the the player who wins is the player with the highest total number on their trees in that row or column so actually in this column it's a draw four four i mean we've only got four trees out and we would have 32 in a in a four player game four four so they would they would draw and get a certain number of points here in this column we've got four and three so the purple tree would win in this column and you do that for every row and column and you mark it up on the scoreboard which um which is just a little a little board and you put some of your leaves so each player has these little wooden leaves which you need for uh for autumn in the second phase of the game uh, the wind starts blowing and it's autumn now and uh, the leaves are going to fall off the tree. So this board shows the direction of the wind. It gets put by whoever's in last place on one side of the board. Um, and so that person determines the direction of the wind in the different, uh, in the different, uh, in the different turns. So it'll start, let's say it's this end at, the, at this board, this side of the board. In the first turn, one of the number one trees will blow this way. Okay, so you've got you've got two trees with each number on two number ones, two number twos, two number threes, two number fours. And when you're putting them down, you're thinking about how you're scoring in summer for the different grid positions of the trees. But you're also thinking about how the leaves are going to fall off these trees. So you will when you've decided which tree which of your two trees marked number one for example you're going to uh, blow leaves off you're going to then decide how many leaves of are going to blow off that tree each player has got a stack of these different uh, punch board leaves and they're numbered from uh, two to eight and then one of them has a picture of a squirrel on so there are eight different ones two to eight and one has a squirrel on and you're going to select one of these and that will be the, the number of leaves that fall off the tree so let's say it's the turn of the four trees to go so here's I've chosen this tree and it's going to blow this way and I've chosen to blow off six leaves I've got these little leaves and they're going to go one two they blow in the, that direction they have to go on uh they have to go on uh squares that are next to a square that is next to the tree and then it has to blow in that general direction and it can always go straight ahead or in a diagonal a diagonally ahead as well so straight ahead or diagonally ahead and you're going to blow your leaves across the board um, each player is going to do that with each of their trees. So once one tree has blown its leaves off, you take it off the board and put it back. So at the end of autumn, you're going to be left with a board covered with leaves and no trees. It's possible for you to blow your leaves on, some, on top of someone else's leaf. You have to pay an extra leaf if you want to do that. And you just stack them on top. Um, at the end of... Uh, at the end of autumn you have another scoring phase which is winter and what you're going to do is you're going to look and see who's got the most leaves in each of the different colored regions so you can just about see here that i've got uh, some red leaves in this in this sort of turquoise area this sort of sea area or lake area and i've got one in this dark blue area and one on this gray area well, there'll be lots of other leaves on here as well and you have to look at each region and see who has the most leaves i mentioned a squirrel when you're blowing leaves off trees once you can choose to blow a squirrel instead of blowing leaves oh i can't find the red squirrel here he is uh, so you the squirrel can move up to three spaces and he can sit on top of a pile of leaves and wins you that that little square and nobody can go on top of it so it's it's 
definitely area control. You're always thinking about how you can get advantage in different areas or, or in spring in different lines. There's loads to think about because the actions you, the, the places you put your trees in spring have an effect not only on summer scoring, but on how you can blow your leaves off in autumn and how you then you're going to score in winter. So there's lots to think about. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. It gives people uh, a really good introduction into area control without that horrible conflict and battles and, and things like that, which some people don't like. So I highly recommend it. This is Bosque. <laughs>